time has not yet come. If not now, when? Father. It has begun. What has? Miracles. Signs and wonders. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You have experienced a miracle, Mary. I saw him. It was incredible. Our Father. Our Father. Who art in heaven. Who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. The man has a following. He's a rogue who answers to no one. You asked me before if I knew his name. Now everyone knows his name. And I fear for his safety. Throw this down for a catch. Do you think that impossible things can happen? That overturn the laws of nature? <laughs> that cannot be explained. son of Alpheus. Yes. This is different. Get used to different. My whole life I have wondered if I would see this day. Follow me, Nicodemus, and you'll see more. God loves the world in this way. But he gave his only son. I'm going to tell everyone. <laughs> I was counting on it. Anything is possible now. Don't you see? Let's go. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to First Baptist Church. You have just seen the trailer for the show, The Chosen, the first multi-season uh, television event based on the life of Jesus. It's fantastic, and we are going to be watching season one as a church Wednesday nights this summer, and we invite all of you to be a part of that. Now, you don't have to come here to watch it because it's all free. This is a crowdfunded event. They put it out there for everybody to watch for free because they want as many people as possible to see it. You can download The Chosen app. I found it on YouTube. You can get it on Peacock. There are lots of places to watch it. But we're doing this as a church this summer on Wednesday nights. And so if you would, grab your order of service. There is a tear-off. I know I, I look funny doing this with the little wing things. I, I get that. Tear off your, uh, your Connect card, and on the back of that are a few things we're asking for information on. One of them, the one in the middle, is about the chosen. You do not have to have this book in order to participate in the study. However, if you like to have something in print to help you as you go along, let us know. We'll order it for you, and we'll have it here, and it's just an additional resource for you. But David is going to be leading a discussion on the chosen on Wednesday nights. You don't have to have the book to follow that. Above that, however, we have some needs. Right now, we're asking for additional help with worship counseling. It's not a difficult job. It requires you to care about people. Can you do that? Way too silent on that one. I'm really worried all of a sudden. 
you can do this. All you need to do is be able to be here regularly, or regularly as in on a monthly or bi-monthly basis on Sunday mornings. Help us, counsel, and folks come forward to find out what's going on in their life and what we can do to help that. And then at the very bottom of that, coming up in a few weeks, we're starting to get back to normal. Augusta Green Jackets are having their faith and family night in person. People are coming. We want you to come with us. It'll be a great time. Let us know, though, that you can come, and we can make sure to be ready for all of that. And then I guess I should finish this off. On the back side of this, we love to have information about you. If you're a guest here, we're thrilled that you're a part of this very fun and special service this morning. We'd love to know a little bit more about you. And what we ask is everybody to fill this out. At least give us your name at the very, very least. You can either leave these in your pew when you leave or drop them in our offering boxes when you drop off your offering at the end of the service. That way we can know that you were here and we can find out what way you can help us. In the order of service itself, you've always got a handful of announcements. We want you to know what's going on here. I'm only going to uh, pick on a couple of these. Particularly Wednesday night is family game night. For reasons that I've never understood, some folk think that they don't need to come to family game night. This is the fun night to come. This is the time we can actually hang out together and just have a good time together without an agenda. We're going to bring some of our favorite board games. I encourage you to bring some of your favorite games. We just sit down around a table with people we don't know as well, and we spend time together. It's a great time. It's part of being a church family. Come on out on Wednesday night. And then at the very bottom of that, you see monthly ministry donations for Mission McDuffie. We always need donations for that. So please don't forget our blue donation bin, which is out underneath the portico outside the fellowship hall. Then I guess I should say, just to be safe, registration for Vacation Bible School and registration for the first couple of events of KidVenture, which is our Wednesday night kids program, those are available now and open on the website. Go to the main page of our website, scroll down a little bit, you'll see a button that says register for VBS. You now know what that means. Next to it is a button that says register for KidVenture. We're with you. We're trying to keep things as simple as possible. We want you to take advantage of that. We want to know what's going on. It is great to have you guys here. Let's pray. Let's turn this service over to God and give some recognition and some honor to some folks who've worked very, very hard over these past few years and deserve that very, very well. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for the creative gifts of those who try to turn the story of your son into something that people can read and see for the first time and hear and understand and believe. So we pray for the ministry that this television event The Chosen has all over the world. We pray that you will bring the fruit of the gospel through that. And for us as a church, that you will help us to learn and understand the story of what you did 2,000 years ago in Palestine. Lord, we pray for all of the all of the things coming up this summer. We're so excited to be back, so excited to see one another again. We pray that everything that we do will bring you glory. Today, however, we honor those who have worked hard in their college programs. They've accomplished much. We're proud of them. And Lord, we pray that today you will help us Honor them even as we seek to set them and all of us on the right path to follow you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.
shall come. We come to our special time to recognize our graduates and uh, looking back from a year ago we were wondering when this day would come and I'm so thankful that we could plan this out and everything graduations for high school and college are pretty much looking normal and, and we can do uh, everything to recognize these graduates. It was great to have a breakfast this morning. Uh, to actually have the Bentleys in the kitchen again. It was a wonderful thing to celebrate them. And uh, we want to, um, you know, I think graduates, as we look back, and this is for our college and high school graduates, what you all have all had to go through just the past couple of years, on top of the other things you had to when you started, um, has helped you along the way in resilience, in uh, being adaptable, and maybe learning new ways of doing things, and I think that will help you in the future. And I think, uh, you know, that helps us be more dependent on our faith as well in God in the most recent times we've been through. So keep your faith in God. And as a part of that, to help you along that, we have a gift today, a Bible, and a Bible study um, plan for the next year that you can go through, another book, and that will help you uh, along the way as you continue for our high school graduates, continue into college, and for our college graduates as you go into your careers and to further education. So with that being said, we want to recognize our high school graduates. Jacob Boone Petrie, son of Robert and Debbie Petrie, is graduating from Briarwood Academy. And after graduation, Jacob plans to attend Georgia Southern University to study construction management. Dozier Gibbs Rogers, son of Chris and Angie Rogers, is graduating from Briarwood Academy. After graduation, Dozier plans to attend Augusta University to study computer science. Let's give a hand for our high school graduates. And now for our college graduates, um, if, if you are here today or if a family member uh, representing would want to come up, we have a gift for them as well. Charles Michael Osborne, son of John and Laura Osborne, is graduating from Mercer University with a Bachelor of Science in Middle Grades Education with minors in Math, History, and Military Science. He is commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Georgia National Guard. And after completing his officer's training, he will work as a middle grades teacher. Andrew John Palmer, son of David and Melinda Palmer, is graduating from Georgia Southern University with a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice and Criminology and a minor in Military Science. He is commissioned as an infantry lieutenant in the Georgia National Guard. He'll be working with the Statesboro Police Department while working on his master's degree in criminal justice at Georgia Southern. <laughs> Drury Thomas Poston, son of Jay and Kelly Poston, is graduating from Augusta University with a Bachelor of Business Administration. Drew will be working at Two State. <laughs> Brian Daniel Smith, Son of Brad and Laura Smith is graduating from Augusta University with a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology from
from Augusta University. Brian has been accepted into the Master of Science in Nursing program with a concentration in clinical nurse leader at Augusta University and plans to start the program in the fall. Christopher Cam Swan, son of Mark and Tina Swan, is graduating from Augusta University with a Bachelor in Business Administration and Certificate in Hospitality Administration. This summer, he will complete an internship with Reynolds at Lake Oconee, and this fall, he will resume working at the Augusta National Golf Club. Now for our master's degree graduates, Chase Norman Beggs, son of Keith and Candy Beggs, is graduating from Augusta University with a Master's of Public Administration. Chase is currently the Planning and Zoning Director for Thompson McDuffie County. His future plans are to continue to serve our community in whatever leadership roles God leads. And Phoebe Nicole Beggs, daughter of Lee Gunn and Jason Jones is graduating from University of Alabama with a master's degree in social work. Nicole works for Child Enrichment Incorporated at a trauma therapist and forensic interviewer. She plans to continue providing therapy and, ob and obtain her license in clinical social work. Thank you to all of our graduates. I'd like to in invite two of our graduates to come right back up, lead us in a time of scripture, if we would all please stand. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes uh, from Psalm 23. It can be found on page 468 of the Pew Bible. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint, me, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, our New Testament reading is Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, and this can be found on page 1010 in your pew Bible. Um, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. You all can have a seat as Wayne comes forward to lead us in a time of prayer, but let's be prepared to stand again when we sing. Please bow your heads. Dear Lord, we come this morning asking that you please surround our youth with your grace and favor. In mercy and kindness, strengthen them with the fortitude of your Holy Spirit. May they be forever filled with your knowledge and wisdom and help them to make decisions that glorify and honor you. Help them follow after you and seek your peace, guidance, and righteousness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we make this commitment. Thank you. 
special thing we'd like to do at this time. Looking through pictures of our high school graduates, I got several pictures from preschool, our preschool, and the foundation that was laid 
many years ago, and parents I know that might not seem so long ago, uh, from our preschool. And we want to recognize our preschool. We had our advancement uh, not many days uh, ago. It's uh, kind of all a blur this week, but it's been really good. This sanctuary was full of families, so very different than last year when we had to do advancement. And it was just refreshing to see the impact our preschool and those ladies make every single day with those kids and how many family members it affects. And that was just the, the you know, foundational family that, and some grandparents, but our preschool for many, many years has making an impact for the kingdom of God. And we are forever thankful for that. So we are recognizing this morning three ladies that are retiring from our ministry. And I want to talk about uh, Miss Benita, and as far as we know, nine years in our preschool ministry, nine years teaching, and we give her thanks and want to recognize her for her many years. I know even in my own children, the impact that she has made in the classroom with it. So let's give a hand for Miss Benita. And Miss Ann Lewis. And as far as we can tell, 10 years, a decade in our preschool teaching ministry, and Miss Ann has done a great job, and I got to see that uh, this year again, even medically as she was going through things. She loved those kids and was here as much as she could with them, and even came back uh, at the very end after her surgery, and we are very thankful for you, Miss Ann, and for all the many years and the lives that you have impacted through Cornerstone Preschool. Let's give a hand. We also are going to recognize today uh, our outgoing preschool director, Corey Langham. Corey, you come on up. Corey has been with our preschool for uh, five or six years, uh, three years as uh, director, and uh, we are just grateful for uh, your leadership and the time that you have invested on that hallway and with those, those kids and with those teachers. And she led our preschool through probably one of the most difficult times in the life of our preschool. Uh, there were so many months that we didn't meet in person, and uh, she and the teachers did such a great job in keeping in, in, in contact with those kids and doing videos and sending things home with them, and we are just so thankful that you helped us navigate some very rough waters and have helped us to be able to be uh, ready for the future and what God has in store, and we pray God's blessings upon you and what he has in store for you uh, now that you're stepping down from our preschool director. Thank you so much for your service and all you did, Corey. God bless you. All right, and at this time we have a preschool video we'd like you to watch, and children, after the video, we'll dismiss you for Children's Church.
Let's give a hand for. All right, kids, if you will come forward, we will now go directly into Children's Church. Miss Candy is right over here. Thank you so much, Ben. You know, when you're a preschooler, uh, especially around snack time, and you're happy, you know it, your face really does show it. I mean, it just is. Uh, uh, Caleb demonstrated that well in that video. And, uh, and Corey, again, thank you. I know it's hard to step down from a group of kids like that. And I know you still love them. And, and she's still going to be helping us in many, many ways with our preschoolers and our nursery and, and children's ministry. And we're thankful for Corey. Uh, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. The feeding of the 5,000 is unarguably one of the most well-known miracles of Jesus. It's the only one that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. And I think sometimes a story that's as familiar as that, it's real easy for us to kind of gloss over some of the details and miss out on some of the significance because we've just heard it so many times. So hopefully we can work on that a little bit today. For example... In Mark's account of this, the story takes place right after the flashback. Remember, we ended last week on a flashback, remembering John the Baptist being beheaded. Now, why would Mark follow up that story with this miracle? I think two reasons. The first is he is contrasting this sumptuous, extravagant royal feast in Herod's palace with this austere wilderness setting way that Jesus is able to satisfy the crowd with the poor man's diet. But the second reason I think Mark puts it here, not just to contrast the two feasts, essentially it's two different feasts we're seeing here, but it's to make the connection for his readers. Remember Mark's original audience were Roman Christians being persecuted by Nero. He's wanting to help make the connection for them between mission and martyrdom, between discipleship and death, that following Jesus can come at a high price. As I said last week, Christian parents need to face the reality of the post-Christian country in which we live and, and the radicalism that is increasing in our culture. We have to disciple our children in such a way that they are prepared to face that world with conviction, but also with compassion. To be able to defend the faith with gentleness and respect, and be able to speak the truth in love, to be able to do what Jesus said in Mark 8, 34. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Because we're going to face rejection. It may even come from our own community, maybe even from our family, our friends, our classmates, or our co-workers. There may be times that we have to shake the dust off our feet and move on, and we may even face threats to our livelihoods, and even our lives from the Herods of our own sin-sick world. So last Sunday's message for Mother's Day was a bit of a challenge, I know. Although I know a few moms really kind of like the whole, uh, at least you're not as bad as Herodias, right? At least you're a better mom than Herodias. Uh, somebody said they were going to hashtag that, better than Herodias. So low bar, I know, but uh, it's a challenging message last week. But I hope that today's message for our graduates and for all of us is one of hope and one of encouragement. We're going to walk through some dark valleys in our life, yes, but we don't walk through them alone. We have a good shepherd, and he does go with us through the dark valleys. He is with us. He is guiding us by his staff. He is protecting us by his rod. Yes, we may be misunderstood and rejected and even hated by people in this world, but after all, our enemy, the devil, is out there coming after us like a hungry lion but again, we don't have to be afraid of him because our good shepherd prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. So in today's story, may we be reminded of the provision of our good shepherd as we navigate the difficult road of this world. May we find strength, courage, and faith in our shepherd who truly provides all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And the first provision we find is His compassionate mercy. So look with me at Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus, reported to Him all they had done and taught. And then because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, 
Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Now, I I never really understood this verse until I was at the Sea of Galilee. You can see across the Sea of Galilee. It's not that big. And you can literally stand on one side and and pretty much see the other side. And it's amazing how in some of the hillside areas, you can really make out towns. You can see cars driving down roads, you know, miles away. So it's, you know, you have to think about that. How did these people from all these towns and villages see Jesus in that boat and get where he was going ahead of him? They really could see him. They really could tell where he was going. And so uh, it says that they got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd... He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Now we have to remember the flow of events here, right? Jesus spent some time working some amazing miracles. He calmed a storm. He cast a legion of demons out of a man. He healed a woman of a 12-year-long disease and he raised a 12-year-old girl to life from the dead. This was a high point of Jesus' ministry. Can you imagine the adrenaline rush the disciples must have had going through them until they get to Nazareth, Jesus' hometown? And then it was like the rug was pulled out from under their feet. Jesus' own people, the people he knew his whole life, rejected him, even tried to kill him. And so the twelve has now witnessed the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows of ministry, and it's their turn. So the next thing Jesus does is He prepares them. He instructs them to send them out to do ministry on their own without Him. And they go in pairs to go out and to heal and to teach, trusting in God's provision and protection, and now fully aware that they won't necessarily be accepted by everyone they go to. And so the disciples, we don't know how long they're out there doing this ministry, But when they're done with this mission, they come back to Jesus and they begin to report to Him all the things they had taught, all the things that they had done, the demons they cast out, the the miracles that they worked. And after such a busy time of ministry, Jesus knew the twelve needed to get away. They needed some time to rest, to reflect, to be refreshed. They needed a spiritual retreat with Jesus. And that makes me think of Psalm 23 where it says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Don't you, sometimes your soul just needs refreshing, doesn't it? You just need to get away and be with Jesus. I think it's beautiful that the first expression of our shepherd's compassionate mercy is on the twelve. It's on his followers. It reminds us the first prerequisite of discipleship is to be with Jesus. That pattern was established way back in Mark chapter 3, verse 14. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, it says He appointed twelve that they might be with Him. Notice that's first. That they might be with Him and that He might send them out to preach. So the life of a disciple isn't just a life of mission for Jesus... It's a life of mission with Jesus. Time with God is essential. If we want to gain wisdom from His Word, if we want to receive power from His Spirit, if we want to remember our identity in Christ to keep our axes sharp and keep our lights burning bright, we must take time to be with Jesus. Because when we don't, when we neglect our relationship with God, even And listen, as a pastor, I know that this happens. Even as you're working for God, you're doing things for God, sometimes it's easy to neglect that time with God. And when that happens, we get discouraged. We get burned out. We get stressed and frustrated. We begin to forget our purpose. We begin to uh, measure ourselves by worldly metrics. We we fall into a performance trap, and, and we miss out on the affection of God's love and the power of His grace. So Jesus wanted to model for His disciples a better way of life and ministry so that when we are burdened and stressed and tired, we can come to Him for rest and we can learn from Him the unforced rhythms of grace. But 
Again, as a pastor, I know about this too. Sometimes life and ministry gets in the way of those good intentions. Yes, we've got to have those times of rest and retreat, but the ever-present demanding crowd interrupts it. They come and they follow Jesus and the disciples around the lake. And, and Jesus, though, Jesus doesn't react to this as an interruption, though, does he? He sees it as a moment of opportunity for more compassionate ministry. You see, there's a balance. Yes, we need times of rest and refreshment, but we also have to remember the purpose for Jesus' mission, and it's the purpose for us. As he says in Mark 10, 45, Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, at first the disciples were fine with this, and they were there. Jesus was teaching, but eventually... Remember, the disciples haven't had time to eat, right? Keep that in mind. Their tummies are growling. They're getting hungry. So they start to see this crowd as an inconvenience as a true interruption. This crowd is a problem. Now, Jesus didn't see it that way. He saw it as an opportunity. They see it as a problem. And and when Mark says that Jesus had compassion on them, that literally means that he felt deep in his gut. He felt something deep in his being for them. It was the compassion a shepherd might have when he sees a, a lost flock that's not been well taken care of, that's wandering around. That's the kind of compassion he had. You know, sheep without a shepherd, they'll wander aimlessly and get lost. Without a shepherd to lead them down to green pastures, they'll go hungry. Without a shepherd to lead them to buy still waters, they will die of thirst. And the implication here is that the religious and political leaders of Israel had neglected their role as the shepherds of God's people. And the people were wandering aimlessly, without leadership. Nobody looking after them. They they were spiritually famished. They needed more than just bread for their tummies. They needed the bread of life for their souls. And so notice how Jesus expresses His compassion. It says in verse 34, He saw them, had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And what did Jesus do out of His compassion? He taught them. He taught them the Word of God. You know, it is important, don't get me wrong, it is important for us to meet people's practical, physical needs. Yes, we're supposed to clothe the naked and feed the hungry and visit those who are sick and in prison. Yes, we're supposed to look after the poor. But Jesus often prioritized the spiritual needs over the physical. Remember, He first forgave the paralyzed man of his sins and then healed him so he could walk. Jesus first teaches this crowd God's Word, then He feeds them with bread and fish. We must never neglect the greatest priority, and that is sharing the gospel. Sharing the truth of God's word with people who were lost in their sin, the people around us who are also like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus shows us that as our good shepherd, He gives us, as His followers, compassionate mercy, but then He also has compassionate mercy for the people around us. Now, I want us to read the rest of the story, and then we'll unpack some more of God's provision. So let's pick it up in verse 35, by this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. Uh, This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countrysides and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, "Uh, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. And Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. So the next thing that we see that God gives us is He gives us creative provision. Creative provision in the most literal of senses. Now the twelve recognize the people's hunger... They saw the need and the problem, and they wanted them to go find their own food. 
Jesus, send them away. Let them go find their own food. Now, I don't think this is a lack of compassion on the part of the disciples. I think it's a lack of vision. It's a lack of imagination. It's a lack of faith. This problem was too big for them. What could they do to solve this problem? It it was too much. The only solution, the only logical thing for them to do is to go find food for themselves. There's restaurants around. There's a few convenience stores over there, Jesus. Let, let, Let them go get some food. You know? Imagine their surprise when Jesus looked at them and said, you give them something to eat. You feed them. Uh, Jesus, did you not just hear us? <laughs> Where are we going to get enough money, much less be able to come up with the food to feed these people? How quickly they forgot the mission they just came back on. Remember? Jesus sent them out and said, take nothing for the journey. Go out and rely on the Lord to provide your needs. How quickly they've already forgotten that lesson. Now, in John's account of this miracle, he specifies that it's five barley loaves. So these aren't like big loaves of bread you think of at the supermarket today. Okay, this, this, wasn't, a, a, you know, this wasn't some sliced sandwich bread. This wasn't nature's own, okay? These were like little barley rolls, little tiny thin cakes that you might eat with lunch. And the fish were probably little sardine-like dried or pickled fish. This was a poor man's meal. In fact, John also tells us that it was Andrew who found the fish and the bread. And you know where he found it? A little boy's lunch sack. There was one little boy in that crowd who had brought something to eat. He was smart. It was one little boy's lunch. Now, the disciples couldn't imagine how in the world that could feed a crowd this size. But you know what? When we're with Jesus, we don't have to rely on human means, do we? We're with Jesus, we don't have to try to limit ourselves to human thinking. The imagery here, too, is very obvious. Look back at verse 39. Notice what Jesus has them do. He sits them down on the green grass. Our shepherd makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us by still waters. He prepares a table before us, and He restores our soul. He is our shepherd who gives us creative provision. You know, even Mark's description of how Jesus had them sit in groups of hundreds and groups of fifties, the the, the Greek there is literally in garden beds. It literally says he had them sit in garden beds. It's a beautiful picture of God's bountiful provision for His people. It's these, these colorfully clad multitude of people like flower beds across the green grass. And Jesus, our good shepherd and our master gardener, takes the bread and the fish, he lifts his eyes up to heaven, and he gives the traditional Jewish blessing before a meal. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And can't you just imagine thousands of voices echoing back, Amen? Can you imagine that moment? And in that moment with that prayer voiced by the one who spoke the universe into being, in the hands of the one who formed from the ground the first human. In that moment, the molecules in those pieces of bread and those fish began to do the impossible. And they multiplied. And they multiplied again and again, a hundred, a thousand fold. Jesus Use nothing less than the power of creation to provide food for these people. He took a poor boy's lunch and turned it into a royal feast enough to feed 10 to 15,000 people. Listen, a God who can do that is a God who can do anything. Amen? This is a God who can supply all our needs. And this creation power that Jesus displayed that day can be at work in our lives. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Nothing is impossible for Jesus, neither materially nor spiritually. No one is beyond his redemptive power. If we are but willing, we can bring to him all of our flaws and failings, all of our weaknesses in our lives, everything that's broken, and he can heal, and he can restore, and he can redeem, and he can do something beautiful with it. Where we see impossibilities, 
Jesus only sees possibility. For nothing is impossible with God. Where we see problems, He sees potential. Where we see scarcity, He sees abundance. For our God can take even the smallest gifts, the barest of resources. If we just give them to Him, He can multiply them and do exceedingly more than we could ever ask or imagine. And that brings us to another provision from our shepherd. He provides us with an opportunity to join Him in cooperative ministry. We see in this story cooperative ministry. The disciples were the ones who noticed the crowd was hungry and brought the need to Jesus. They're the ones who said something needed to be done about it. But then Jesus turned it back on them. Now John's account tells us that this was a big test. That Jesus knew all along what He was going to do. He had a plan. He wanted to see what the disciples would do. What would they say when He put this need in their lap? You see, God has chosen to work His plans largely through us, through His people. Now, God doesn't need us, but He wants us. He wants us to experience Him, to know Him as He works through us. And so Jesus sent them out to investigate the possibilities, to bring back the resources, meager as they were. Jesus instructed them to have the people sit down in groups. Jesus used them to distribute the food to the masses. This gives us some grand insights into how we participate in God's mission. First, we see that God wants to use us to feed the world with the bread of life. Again, God is perfectly capable of doing everything He wants to do without you and me. Listen, Jesus didn't need that fish and bread. He could have created fish and bread out of nothing. He could have spoken into existence as He did the world. In the universe, Jesus didn't need the disciples to distribute the bread. He could have had it appear right in front of everybody. God doesn't need us. But God's ways are not our ways. And in the infinite mystery of God's will, which I will never understand, God delights to work through me. He delights to work through you. Isn't that amazing? When you stop and you think about it, me? God delights to work through me? In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul puts it this way. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. We're just jars of clay. And why? To show that this all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. Or as God Himself told Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. And so Paul responds, I'm going to boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. God uses common clay jars like us, weak as we are, so that there's no mistaking who the source of the power is. Listen, don't ever disqualify yourself from service by saying that you're not smart enough. You don't know the Bible enough. You're not holy enough. You're not wise enough to be used by God. It's not true. We we fool ourselves when we think that we have anything more than barley loaves to give Him. Every Sunday I stand here, I say, Lord, I'm just bringing you my barley loaves. It's not much, but I know you can take it and do something with it. That's all we have to give. The best that we have are filthy rags compared to God's holiness and glory. All we have to give Him is a poor boy's lunch in jars of clay. So when you feel like a failure, when you feel like you're out of your league, just trust Jesus. Just trust in Him. Believe that He has a plan. Believe that He already knows what He wants to do through you. Listen, you simply have to be available. Give Him what you have and trust Him to do something amazing with it. Something far beyond anything you could ever do on your own. Because the miracle here in this story, did it take place in the disciples' hands? Is that where the miracle happened? No. It took place in His hands. We have to give to Jesus our meager resources. Then He consecrates it. He blesses it. He multiplies it. Pastor and commentator Warren Wiersbe put it this way. He said, we're not the manufacturers. We're just the distributors. We just distribute what God does. What He provides. 
The pattern for us is to open our eyes to the needs around us, pay attention to the people that He brings into our circles of influence, be honest about the resources, the gifts, the talents, the opportunities He gives us. Don't think too highly of them, but also don't disqualify them. Trust them to Jesus. Bring the needs that you see and the resources you have to Him because He will only work the miracle when we place the loaves in His hands. When we let Him take it and bless it and use it to do so much more than we could ever imagine. This is how God has chosen to send the bread of life into the world. This is His plan. We are the body of Christ. We are His hands and His feet and His mouth. Us, you and me, look in the mirror. Look around you at the people you see around you. We're just jars of clay. But oh, the treasure we hold within us is beyond reasoning. Now the next provision, the bread that Jesus gives always brings complete satisfaction. It always brings complete satisfaction. Listen, this wasn't just a snack to tide them over till they could get to a restaurant somewhere. God is not a God of scarcity. He's a God of abundance. Think about when Jesus turned the water into wine. They said this was the best wine they'd ever tasted. When Jesus gave manna in the desert, it was always enough to fill the belly of everybody who ate it. And on the day before the Sabbath, He gave enough to last them through the Sabbath day. And we also receive so much abundance from the hand of God. In Philippians 4.19, it says, My God will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus, His riches. And in Colossians chapter 2, Paul says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness, to completion, to total satisfaction. Listen, Jesus always satisfies because His provision always comes from His compassionate mercy for us. And His mercies are new every morning. His grace knows no bounds. His endless power can perfectly provide your need. Let's circle around back to the beginning of this story. I remember how the story began. The disciples were hungry. They were so busy with ministry, they didn't even have time to eat. And before they could begin to find food to eat, here comes this hungry crowd, and Jesus says, you feed them. Now, can you imagine the disciples out there passing out this bread and fish? Their tummies are growling. They're looking at their watches. They're thinking, I need to eat something, Jesus. But they're busy feeding the crowd. But notice at the end of the story, after the crowd ate their full and are satisfied, how many baskets of leftovers were there? Twelve. Why twelve? There are twelve apostles. One for each of them. Listen to this. Jesus worked through them to be agents of God's provision and hospitality to the people. And now the tables were turned. And now they were being provided with something to eat through the people they just served. There's a principle there. When we serve the Lord, He blesses us with the leftovers. Their cup overflowed enough to provide them something to eat. And the Greek word for basket here means a small wicker hand basket. Basically a Jewish lunchbox. There was just enough food left over for each of them to also eat and be satisfied. You see, Jesus takes good care of His servants. Amen? If we put others before ourselves and serve them, Jesus will take care of us. If we pursue first His kingdom and His righteousness, He will give us all that we need. Now there's a similar miracle that happens later on that I want to look at briefly. The feeding of the 4,000. Now only Matthew and Mark record this miracle. Go ahead and turn over to, to Mark 8. Maybe just one page in your Bible. Now some scholars want to argue that this is just a doublet. This is a retelling of the same miracle. That, that, that there was a corrupted version of this story that made its way around and, and was either inserted into Matthew or Mark. These people do some, some amazing uh, logistical uh, gymnastics to try to argue this. I don't think they could be any more wrong. These stories are so very different. And so as we read 
this, I want you to try to notice the differences between the first miracle and this one. Beginning in verse 1, during those days, another large crowd gathered. You know, because there's crowds all the time, right? Jesus is always drawing a crowd. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called His disciples to Him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to disciples to set before the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. And afterward, the disciples picked up seven baskets of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present. And having sent them away, he got into a boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. All right, so the differences between these stories, just a few. You have 5,000 people who have been with Jesus one day versus 4,000 people who have been with Jesus three days. In the first miracle, it's the disciples who call Jesus' attention to the hungry crowd. In the second miracle, Jesus is the one who notices and says something to the disciples. Of course, you've got five loaves and two fish versus seven loaves and a few fish. Uh, And to my friends with me on Honduras that year that I did the devotional, see, I wasn't confused about the number of fish. Just remember that. They gave me a hard time about that. Notice the difference of locations. The first miracle happened in Bethsaida, the second in the region of the Decapolis. And even the leftovers are different. You have five, 12 baskets. See, I'm messing up my numbers again. You have 12 baskets. Versus seven baskets. So there's a lot of differences here. These are two different accounts, two different episodes. But it's these last two differences I want to focus on as we wrap up with this final provision from our Good Shepherd. The provision of His comprehensive grace. His comprehensive grace. This second miracle happened in Gentile territory. The first miracle happened in Bethsaida. Bethsaida is on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. That's Jewish territory. The Decapolis, which literally means ten cities, was a Roman area. This was a Gentile region. Do you remember the demon-possessed man, the man who had a, a legion of demons in him? Remember, he was in the Decapolis. That's where that miracle happened, on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And if you remember after Jesus cast out the demons, the man wanted to follow Jesus and said, No, 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 you go back to your people, the people who've known you best. You go back to this region and tell them what God has done for you. So you know what I like to think? I like to think that that man got hard at work. He went all over the Decapolis telling people about what Jesus had done for him. So when Jesus and the disciples land here, there's a ready crowd waiting. They've heard about Jesus and they want to see him do the same thing in their midst. They want to hear what he has to say. And they are with him for three days listening to him teach and experiencing His miraculous power. Jesus, just as He fed a largely Jewish crowd in the first miracle, is feeding a largely Gentile crowd. Even the numbers of leftovers is significant. Now, I'm not one to to read significance into every number in the Bible. Yes, some numbers of the Bible are symbolic, some are literal, sometimes it's both. But I think we have to acknowledge that in the first miracle, among the Jewish people... There were 12 baskets of leftovers. Yes, one for each disciple, but why are there 12 disciples? Because there are 12 tribes of Israel. In that first miracle, Jesus demonstrated that God gives perfect provision for Israel. But here we are in Gentile territory, and the number of leftovers is seven. Now, why seven? Seven is the number of perfection, the number of completion. How many days did God use to complete creation? Seven. What Jesus is showing them here. And and, and the word for baskets here, the Greek word here, isn't a little hand basket. It's like a big bushel basket. It's a basket big enough for a man to sit in. In fact, in Acts chapter 9, Paul is lowered from a wall to escape people who want to kill him in a basket. Same Greek word. So for the Jews, he gives them just enough for each one of them. But here among the Gentiles, Jesus provides complete, perfect, abundant provision 
for the Gentiles. What Jesus is saying is there's enough of me to go around for the whole world. There's enough of me for everyone. I didn't come just for the Jews. My grace is comprehensive. Whosoever will may come. God's grace is sufficient for all the world. There's enough room at His banquet table for everyone who is willing to come. Amen? Whereas John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, so that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. In the Great Commission, Jesus sends us out to make disciples of all nations, of every ethnos, of every ethnicity. And the Revelation tells us that around the throne will be represented every nation, tribe, and tongue. God's grace is sufficient. It is comprehensive. It includes you and it includes me. No matter who you are, where you come from, what your background is, or what you've done, there's a place at His table for you if you'll accept His invitation. Jesus looks at you with compassion. He came to find you. A lost sheep, wandering without a shepherd, hungry. And He wants to make you His. He wants to bring you home. He wants to feed your soul. He wants to make you whole. And He wants you to share that same life-giving, world-changing love with others. He wants you to be His partner as His child and His servant, to go out and rescue other lost sheep. Will you answer His call? Graduates, will you answer His call? Church, will you answer His call? Maybe for you, you need to come to Him today and answer the call to salvation. You need to say, Jesus, I want to be in your flock. I ask you to be my shepherd and forgive my sins. I cast myself at your feet and I ask for your sufficient, comprehensive grace to completely satisfy the hunger and the thirst in my soul. If that's you, as we sing in a moment, I pray you would come down and give your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe God is calling you to unite with this local flock, this congregation here. Maybe God is calling you to join Him in His redemptive work. There's a ministry in this church. Maybe you've been asked to serve in a certain way. Maybe you've had a burden on your heart to serve in a certain area of this church, but you've had excuses, you've had your reasons why you've said no. Maybe today's the day you say yes. Or maybe God is calling you to full-time Christian ministry. Maybe He's calling you to the mission field or to serve His church as as a pastor or a worship leader, to work with youth or children. Will you trust Him enough to take your meager provisions place them in His hands, and watch Him do something wondrous. Will you? Let's stand and pray together. Father, thank You for Your perfect provision, Your compassionate mercy. Thank You for being a God who doesn't just give us the scraps, who doesn't just tide us over. You are the God who completely satisfies our every need and desire of our soul. Your forgiveness is complete. Your joy is so satisfying. Your peace passes understanding. You long to bless us with so much, Father. And your grace is so comprehensive. Father, if there are those today you are calling to come and experience that grace for the first time, I pray they would set aside whatever fears, whatever excuses they have, they would come now and put their faith and trust in the one who gave his all for them. If there are those you are calling you not with this church family or to answer your call into Christian ministry, I pray they would come and boldly stand before this congregation and let them know what you are doing in their life. And Father, for all of us that are of your flock, help us as we leave this place to join you in your ministry to feed this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You come now as we sing and the Spirit leads you. Come behold the wondrous place free He the perfect Son
All God's people said, Amen. Amen. What an unwavering hope we have. His grace is truly unmeasurable. His abundance is so evident all around us if we would but look. I've been so pleased with uh, the generosity of this church and the way God has provided so abundantly through you. Uh, just as He used those disciples to multiply what they had to feed so many, God uses what we give. And He multiplies it and does more with it than we could ever imagine that we could do on our own. For the first time that I know of, we've given more than $10,000 to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Our goal was $8,200. let us give God glory for that. <laughs> Through that, God is going to be using missionaries and church planners all around our country and in Canada to share the hope of glory with people, to build churches, to meet needs, physical and spiritual. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving to the Go and Tell Mission Fund. Through your generosity there, we're able to support ministries like Smoky Mountain Resort Ministries. Uh, ben and I and a few others are going to be going tomorrow to help uh, move things out of the old, dilapidated dorm that's kind of fallen in on itself and into the new house that we've been able to purchase. Uh, we had a goal of raising $55,000 by June 17th because somebody has generously offered to match that to make it $110,000 toward paying off this house that we've purchased. Uh, we've already raised over $40,000 of that. God's a, not we as a church, but Smoky Mountain Resort Ministries. Uh, through your Go and Tell Mission Fund, we're contributing uh, $2,000 to that this week. So I just want to give God the praise and the glory for His provision, for the way that He does so much to help us as we serve His kingdom. Thank you for your partnership through your prayers, through your giving, and through your going and being the hands and feet of Jesus. Let's pray. We're going to sing the solid rock as we go, and I hope that you'll join us back next week. And again, to all of our graduates, thank you all so much for being here, and congratulations to you. We pray for you. God bless you in your journey going forward. Father, thank you so much for these young men and women and 
for all that you have done in their life and, and provided for them and led them to this point, the way you've equipped them with experience, with education. And we do pray you would bless them going forward, God, that you would help them as they go into this world, that they, through whatever their career or calling, would be able to use that as a ministry to share the hope of Jesus Christ with people that are lost and wandering aimlessly. God, that they could be your hands and feet, helping humanity to flourish and thrive the way you want them to do. God, continue to provide for them, protect them, bless them, and use them. And I pray, God, you would receive the offerings we give, the prayers we offer, and the efforts as we go. Bless and use them to do immeasurably more than anything we could ever ask or imagine. It's in the name of Christ, our good shepherd, we pray. Amen. Amen. On Christ the solid rock I stand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Oh.